So in today's lesson, we're going to look at the 35 meter fitness test, in which the main purpose is to assess a performer's running speed. Before completing the 35 meter sprint test, the performer needs to complete a sufficient warm up, which increases the heart rate, raises muscular temperature, as well as dynamically stretches all of the major muscle groups in the performer's body. This will minimize the potential risk of injury because the 35 meter sprint test is performed at maximal intensity. To set up a 35 meter sprint test, an assessor or the performer needs to find a suitable non-slip and flat running surface. They need to set up a 35 meter running track with cones or lines with adequate starting and finishing space at either end. A performer should start in the best position that suits them, so for some it might be the sprint start technique, others it might be a standing start, but they're waiting for a starting sound or word that the assessor is going to call out. Upon hearing this, the performer needs to get from point A, or the start line, to point B, the finish line, as quickly as possible. The assessor is responsible for starting the timer when they give the command to go, as well as stopping the timer when the performer reaches the finish line. Although this test is maximal, with sufficient rest and recovery time, be it 10 minutes, 15 minutes, the performer is able to complete two to three repetitions of this test. What this allows the performer or the assessor to do is to add up all of the times recorded, divide it by the number of repetitions they do of the test to arrive at an average time. With this result, the performer or the assessor can then compare it against normative data tables and determine if the performer is above average, at average or below average according to their age and gender. To increase the accuracy of the 35 meter sprint test, what a performer or assessor could use instead are speed gates. This removes the probability of human error interfering with the accuracy of the results recorded. Should a performer be using speed gates, then they would set them up on the original start and finish line, but they would also mark a new start line where they will begin running from five meters back from the original start line. That first speed gate will then record or measure as soon as that sensor field is broken by the performer's body, and again, when they break the one at the finish line. By using speed gates, we now have the computer systems generating far more accurate and precise readings of time at the start and end of the 35 meter sprint test. They're far superior when compared to a human with a stopwatch guessing, essentially, when the performer crosses the line at the beginning and end. It's important, however, for the performer to compare their results to the correct normative data table. There are different ones which have been produced for a 0 to 35 meter sprint test that we spoke about originally, compared to the negative five meter start line through the speed gate and then to the finish line. That extra five meters will alter the result greatly because they've now gone through their accelerative phase and are straight into their maximum speed rather than using the first five meters of that 35 sprint test for the acceleration phase. With the sprint test, there are many benefits, but there are also some drawbacks. We're gonna look at the benefits first. Should a performer just be using a stopwatch and cones, then it's a very simple and quick to execute fitness test. It requires minimal and simple equipment and can be executed by anyone. It doesn't require specialist knowledge. Because a performer is working at 100% intensity and there's very few variables that can impact on the overall result, we can say that it's a very valid test. The quality or result is directly linked to the quality of the component of fitness, speed. Should a performer be using speed gates as well, then it's actually a very accurate and precise form of fitness testing. By using computer systems, we can generate very reliable test results, which moves us into the drawbacks. The first and major one being, especially in the simple method using stopwatches and cones, there's large probability of human error. From the moment that timer gives the command to start, We've got the delay in the reaction time occurring in the sprinter, and we've also got the delay or the, the inaccuracy of the timer starting the stopwatch at the very moment they've given the command to start. Should the timer be slightly early on starting the stopwatch, then that's going to give a slower time for the performer. Furthermore, if we're comparing two performers, one might have an exceptionally good reaction time compared to the other, so even though their speed is the same, one's going to get a better result because we're testing their reaction time. So to remove this conflict of components of fitness that we're testing by using speed gates, the time start and finish only when the performer breaks that sensor field. There's no reaction times involved, making it a far more accurate and valid form of fitness testing. However, if a performer does choose to use speed gates, they will require specialist knowledge to set them up and operate them correctly. 
They will come at a cost to a performer as well, so not every single person will have access to this piece of equipment. So, to summarise the 35 metre sprint test, the purpose of it is to assess a performer's running speed. Following a sufficient warm up, an assessor or the performer sets up a 35 metre runway on a flat, slip free surface. Upon hearing the starting command, the performer tries to make their way from point A at the start line to point B, the finish line, 35 metres away, as quickly as possible. The assessor who gave the command to start also begins the stopwatch when they give it and they stop it when they see the performer cross the finish line. An alternative method is to utilise speed gates. If they are using speed gates, then instead of starting from zero metres, they instead create a new start line minus five metres. They start from here, build up their acceleration, build up their speed, to then break the sensor field of the speed gate at zero metres. They then run their 35 metre sprint. When they get to the end, they break the second sensor field and the computer works out a far more precise and accurate reading of how long it took them to cover that distance, giving them speed. The sprint test using stopwatches and cones is very simple, it requires minimal equipment and it can be done anywhere very quickly. However, the probability and impact of human error on the 35 metre sprint test is very high. Should a performer have slow reaction times or the assessor starts the timer at the incorrect moment, then we're going to get invalid results. Speed gates are an excellent way to negate this human error probability because we're relying on computer systems to start and stop the timer as accurately as it can. The drawbacks to using speed gates, however, are that they are costly and they do require specialist knowledge in order to set them up and operate them correctly. So that's the 35 meter sprint test. I hope you found that mini lesson useful. If you did, then feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can be kept up to date with all the video and all the content that we're going to be bringing you. Alternatively, if you want to learn more about the private tuition or the teaching and learning resources that we provide, then visit us at thepetutor.com and you can contact one of our team. I hope to hear from you or see you very soon.